Hello dear friends of human spaceflight! This week we have quite some exciting news from the final frontier for you. For one, the European Mars orbiter ExoMars has discovered something in the Valles Marineris Canyon on Mars, which could be a complete game changer for future human missions there. It could directly affect the site where the first humans will land on the red planet. Then we have to talk about all these satellite mega constellations popping up these days. Apparently now everybody wants to send tens of thousands of satellites to orbit and this obviously cannot work. Then there are allegations of sexual harassment at SpaceX and we also have to talk about that even if it's not a fun topic. But then the Super Heavy booster has been transported to its launch site at Starbase Texas. What exactly is SpaceX planning here? And the running gag in the end, another delay for the James Webb Space Telescope. I know, hilarious, right? Well, there's a lot to talk about, so let's get right to it. Some of you might remember that we used to make a few videos on potentially interesting landing sites for future human missions to Mars. In a collaboration between the University of Arizona and NASA, some interesting landing sites were already previously identified with the Erebus Montes region in the northwestern lowlands called Arcadia Planitia. There are a few important prerequisites a future landing site for humans on Mars must suffice. First, there must be significant subsurface water ice deposits as water is quintessential for human life support systems but also for generating rocket fuel. Rocket fuel will be produced directly on site via the famous Sabatier process where CO2 is extracted from the atmosphere and combined with hydrogen under high temperature and pressure to obtain methane and water. The hydrogen will be obtained from electrolysis of water and that is another reason why water ice deposits are extremely important. We know that Starship fuel consists of liquefied oxygen and methane. The methane is, as we said, obtained via the Sabatier process and oxygen will also be obtained via electrolysis from water ice. Hence, large water ice deposits are a must for any future landing site. But the landing site should not be too far away from the equator since Mars has an actual tilt of 25.19 degrees which is extremely close to Earth's tilt of 23.44 degrees. This means that the higher latitude regions on Mars experience a weaker sun since, as on Earth, the sun does not rise so high over the horizon. Therefore, the power generated from solar arrays will be reduced and a large part of power generation will come from solar arrays, not everything of course, because additional radioisotope batteries will be needed as a supplementary power source. But now the problem is that water ice is more prevalent exactly where the sun is weaker, in the higher latitude regions. Therefore, all future landing sites would be located at a sweet spot where the sun is still strong enough for sufficient power generation but also far enough away from the equator to allow for significant subsurface water ice deposits. To make all that even more complicated, the site will also need to be low lying in order to reduce radiation exposure from space. Thus, not many sites are available as this would always be some sort of compromise. But now this could entirely change with the discovery of ESA's ExoMars Orbiter. With an onboard scientific instrument called the Resolution Epithermal Neutron Detector, abbreviated as FRIEND, that can detect hydrogen, scientists found large water ice deposits in the Valles Marineris Canyon system. Because hydrogen is mostly bound in form of water ice on Mars, a higher hydrogen count equals a higher water ice concentration. This finding comes as a surprise since it was thought that large water ice deposits could not exist near the equator and the Valles Marineris Canyon system, which is the largest canyon in the entire solar system, is located almost exactly at the equator. 
the Valles Marineris now suddenly becomes an interesting landing site and probably the best one for multiple reasons. First of all, it is the most spectacular landing site of all. Landing in the largest canyon of the solar system is certainly more exciting than in some boring low-lying planes. There is certainly a lot to discover and future astronauts would certainly find this area more exciting to explore. Then the elevation of Valles Marineris is extremely low. On this high resolution elevation map we can see that especially the eastern part of the canyon has an elevation that is even lower than the lower plains of the northern hemisphere. Thus radiation exposure there would be even lower, since highly energetic cosmic particles would be attenuated more by the larger amount of atmosphere between space and the surface. Actually radiation would be even lower since radiation from the sides would be reduced because a potential future base would be flanked by giant canyon cliffs as compared to planes where side radiation would bombard the astronauts unhindered. Then being so close to the equator, the average solar irradiance on the surface would be really excellent with 590 watts per square meter, which is 59% that of Earth's highest irradiance of 1000 watts per square meter. So power generation in Valles Marineris would be a lot more efficient than in the low-lying plains of Arcadia Planitia. Thus the Valles Marineris could turn out to become the favorite landing site for the first humans to Mars and we can already picture how exciting a base in some part of the Valles Marineris system would look. And please subscribe to this channel if you like news about spaceflight developments of all kinds with sometimes a bit of a humorous undertone. Thanks a lot in advance. Now from Mars to Earth orbit. We all like Starlink, right? SpaceX's groundbreaking satellite constellation already counts over 1500 satellites, enabling high bandwidth internet in areas that had previously been denied internet access. It will also strengthen SpaceX's business model by generating massive revenue from subscription fees. But now the problem is that everybody wants to have their own satellite mega constellation, which for obvious reasons cannot work. Starlink alone has plans to expand their satellite constellation to 42,000 satellites. So we are talking 42,000 satellites from low Earth orbit at around 400 kilometers of height above the surface to 1200 kilometers. Amagen's project Kuiper is comparably quite modest with plans to launch only 3200 satellites. But now more and more filings are pouring in and their satellite numbers are getting insanely ridiculous. The government of Rwanda, for example, filed an application with the International Telecommunications Union in September for a constellation with a whopping 327,230 satellites. What? Like seriously, what the hell is going on here? Okay, this cannot be taken too seriously, but China is also planning their Starlink rival and China should always be taken quite seriously. Then a Canadian company called Kepler has filed for a satellite constellation called Aether or Aether, which would sport 115,000 satellites. Personally, I already thought that SpaceX is filing to expand Starlink to 42,000 satellites was already way over the top. And I think that 12,000, which represented the initial plan, should have been more than enough. But with all these new satellite mega constellation plans popping up, it is absolutely clear that it cannot work long term. Earth orbit would become so cluttered at some point that the risk of collisions would rise exponentially which would create more space debris, which would in turn create more collisions and so on and so forth. A horror scenario which we know by the name of Kessler syndrome. If such a collision cascade of satellites were to occur, presence in low Earth orbit would become really dangerous. Newer models have shown that we would still be able to send rockets to space, so our interplanetary future might not necessarily be at risk. However, 
low Earth orbit space stations in that case would not be possible anymore, as an altitude from 400 to 1200 kilometers would become a really dangerous zone and collision risk extremely high. In order to avoid this, it is quite clear that we need an international treaty ASAP on how to deal with these mega constellations and also to set some maximum allowable numbers of satellites. So now that SpaceX was the first one and has by far the largest satellite constellation right now, we predict that they will have the monopoly for quite some time. Now to some not so nice news. Yes, even worse than the satellite constellations. After reports had surfaced in late September about sexual harassment and other bad conducts at Blue Origin, it appears now that SpaceX's working environment could also use a lot of improvement. In a report released on December 14th, a former female mission integration engineer at SpaceX released a report published on Lioness where she details quite some unnice details about bad workplace behavior. If true, I really hope that this will get sorted out because SpaceX should be a company that goes forth with good example, not only regarding technological progress and achievements, but also regarding ethical conduct. Thus, hopefully, these allegations will be investigated properly and consequences will be drawn. Such stuff should not be tolerated in any form. On to better news about SpaceX, namely the Super Heavy Rocket Booster 4 has been transported to the orbital launch mount at Starbase, Texas. This is the first potentially flight-ready booster with 29 sea-level Raptor engines installed. It appears that SpaceX might already be preparing for the first orbital test flight which is currently planned for January or February 2022. This could in turn mean that SpaceX is expecting the FAA to approve orbital Starship launches from Starbase, which is located at Boca Chica Beach near Brownsville in South Texas. It will get quite exciting very soon, so let's hope that the FAA will approve orbital launches from Starbase. If not, SpaceX will probably transport its Super Heavy and Starship prototypes to Florida as they are currently in the process of building a launch pad for the Starship Super Heavy system at the Kennedy Space Center, with another one being planned for Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. And don't forget, we also have the sea launch platforms. Exciting times with or without FAA approval. What is not so exciting are the constant delays of the James Webb Space Telescope. The launch has now slipped again to no earlier than December 24th. In a brief statement, NASA said that a communication issue between the observatory and the launch vehicle system was the cause for that latest delay. Let's hope the issues will be resolved and we might get a nice Christmas present after all. Because the James Webb Space Telescope is quite possibly the most important piece of hardware launched to space since the Hubble Space Telescope 31 years ago. So then, friends of human spaceflight, we hope you enjoyed this episode despite some negative news, but do not worry, either way the future is looking pretty bright for humanity, because we will end up becoming a space-faring civilization, there is just no way around it. We wish you all the best, dear viewers, and on to the future!